record again will reflect that we're back in session on State v. Fleischauer. Dr. Mills was in her direct examination. Mr. Kaiser, your next question. Doctor, knowing there's other aspects of these injuries in 144N that we're going to look at as we go along, is there anything else you want to talk about here before we move on? No. Thank you. In what uh, is faintly labeled as uh, 144O in your PowerPoint, what are we seeing here? Now we're seeing uh, Mr. Chase Fleshhauer's top of the head is what we're, we're from that standpoint. Again, the scalp is still reflected and you're seeing the top of the skull bone or the calvarium. And the uh, arrow at the top pointing off to the left is now showing you the entrance gunshot wound in the left uh, frontal bone of Mr. Chase Fleshhauer that corresponds to the left forehead. And um, at the bottom, you see another blue arrow off to the left there, indicated and labeled by a linear skull fracture that is going across in a almost 45 degree angle to the bottom of your screen and going off and just to the right of that blue arrow, that's actually some hair that was still on the scalp that didn't get wiped away. So the fracture is that line or linear fracture there that you're seeing or directly the blue arrow is pointing to. And to the left of that arrow, that deep red color, that's hemorrhage again called periosteal hemorrhage, so hemorrhage on the outside of a bone. So you see that as well, and again at the top, the reflected skin surface, the subgaleal hemorrhage, you're also seeing again as well. I don't want to spend too much time here, but the, the portion of it that you said was a hair that hadn't been moved. Could you come down to the screen to your left and just point out where that is? That is this line right here, which is again just to the, which would be the left of the arrow, and it's this dark and it's kind of coming to a point. And the actual skull fracture is this at a 45 degree linear fracture here from the cross almost to where the left ear is located, which is at the left of the photo. And if you can see this little white squiggly line, that's the coronal suture, so that's where the bones have fused. That separates the frontal bone from the parietal bone. And again, it's opposite and not going towards an entrance gunshot wound that's here at the top left side of the uh, screen. Did you form an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether or not the linear skull fracture you have labeled here in 144O in your PowerPoint occurred at the same time as the gunshot wound or prior to the gunshot wound? Prior to the gunshot wound. Do we have that a reasonable degree of medical certainty, Your Honor? And that was to that degree of certainty, Doctor? Yes, it was. Thank you. I'm sorry if I didn't say it loud enough. I'll try to do better next time. Um, counsel, strike that counsel come, on. come on up. Mr. Kaiser. Knowing we're going to discuss the linear skull fracture in a couple minutes, Doctor, is there anything else here that you'd like to look at in all? No. Thank you. In what is uh, labeled in your PowerPoint as Exhibit 144P, uh, could you tell us what we're looking at here? We're still looking at the top of Mr. Chase Fleshhauer's head with the scalp reflected, but we're looking more towards the back of the head now with that part of the subgaleal tissue removed. So you can now see, to a greater extent, a larger fracture than what you were able to pre appreciate in the last photograph. And again, the blue arrow is indicating where that is going or where it's at. And again, it's roughly about a 45 degree angle in your photo that you're looking at and extending towards the left ear region. And uh, how, if in any way, is what you have labeled here in 144P, the linear skull fracture, oriented in relation to the entrance wound of the gunshot? It is away from and does not stem or radiate from that particular wound. It is separate. Anything else in 144P you want to talk about before we move on? Uh, just pointing out there's more subgaleal and periosteal hemorrhage below that linear skull fracture in that tissue that you can see at the scalp that dark red maroon. Um, at the end, if you follow the end of the linear skull fracture to where it ends in the right of the photo, sort of, 
that's where you can start seeing the hemorrhage there, but there's also a hemorrhage on the opposite side of the head a little bit there as well. Is the hemorrhaging you've pointed out in the last two slides to a reasonable degree of medical certainty hemorrhaging resulting from uh, the linear skull fracture or from the gunshot? Jack, do that as leading. Overruled, you can answer. It is a mixture of both. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Your Honor. It is a mixture of both. Thank you. Anything else we want to look at in what's labeled 144P in your PowerPoint before we move on? No. Thank you. What are you demonstrating to us here in Exhibit 144Q in your PowerPoint? Now I am showing the left side of the left side of the skull, showing you on a perpendicular angle the entrance gunshot wound from the outside, so the outer table of the skull. And you can see the hole or gunshot wound defect there and a little bit of the surrounding tissue, but you see a nice clean bone edge for about 40% of that particular um, defect. And what I'm trying to, what I am showing there is that there is no soot there. What does that mean? The, the elements that we discussed that we're using to establish range of fire, soot is one of those elements we're looking for. So it's further than what I would see for a closer range gunshot wound. Thank you. Anything else in 144Q we should discuss before we move on? No. Thank you. What are we seeing in 144R in your PowerPoint? Uh, what we're seeing now is trying to establish if soot was actually deposited that I would, since I was not able to see it with my naked eye, which is called a gross observation, I took samples of the skin edges to see if soot was embedded in the wound edges as well, and that's what we're looking at. The, um, Photograph on the left, where you can see the purple at the top right of that particular corner, that's the surface of the skin. Then you've got some fibrous tissue and some glands kind of going beneath it, and where you see little pockets of white, that's fat or adipose tissue. That, these are all components of the layers of the skin. Um, you're not seeing anything black. Black is soot. The photograph on the right is showing another edge, and at the top right corner again, you can see the top where the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, and you're seeing the nice edge there with no soot apparent. And again, what aspect of your eventual formation of your opinion as to manner of death does the presence or lack of soot address? It helps address range of fire. And by range of fire, you mean what? The distance between the end of the barrel of a weapon to the surface of the target. Anything else in 144R we should talk about in your PowerPoint before we move on? No. What are we seeing here and what's labeled as 144S? Now we're still at the top of the head of Mr. Chase Fleshhauer and the calvarium or the top of the skull has been removed. The photograph on the left, the dura or a membrane that surrounds the brain is still apparent and there's still a lot of blood there. What I'm trying to show you is where that arrow is located at the bottom, labeled as bullet core fragment. I don't think you can appreciate it because it's mangled. It's a copper color and it has blood on it, so it, it's very difficult to appreciate in this particular photograph, but that's where a separate um, deformed jacket of the projectile was located in that back left occipital region. Doctor, or, in, oh, sorry, I apologize. No, go ahead. In, in your process of the couple of the parts of the bullet that you've shown us um, during the autopsy, what, if anything, did you do with those parts of the bullet? I saved them, photographed them, and kept them as evidence. What part of the manner of death uh, does the bullet core fragment on the left side of 144S help us appreciate? I wouldn't say it has an implication to the manner of death, but to the cause of death. Which was? Uh, cerebral lacerations due to a gunshot wound to the head. And what's shown in the photograph on the left side? On the left side, we're a little closer in towards the skull, and we're looking again at the floor of the skull where the calvarium or top of the skull has been removed. 
The dura has now been stripped, so we're now seeing the inner table or the inside of the skull. And um, you see a blue arrow labeled with skull fracture of attempt of bullet to exit the skull. And it's a uh, oblong-ish 3.5 centimeter depressed fracture. What's a depressed fracture? Meaning it's kind of sunken in. And I, mis I misspoke, and I'm sorry. On that photograph on the left, I said jacket. I meant to say lead core. I apologize. If I'm wrong about this, tell me. Does the collective picture here in 140? Object to this is leading. Well, I haven't heard the question yet. Mr. Kaiser, question? Where, if anywhere, did the bullet end up? That would be the photograph on the left, showing the lead core separated from the jacket. The jacket has not been displayed yet. I misspoke on that. It's okay, but <coughs> where, if anywhere, did the bullet leave the body? It did not leave the body. What if any effect let's see, to, a reasonable degree, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what if any effect did the bullet entrance have on the skull in the front left portion of Mr. Chase Fleischauer's head? Please repeat the question. I'll try to call him. I'll try it on a different slide. Um, is there anything else on 144S we'd like to look at? No. What are you showing us in 144T? I'm showing again the floor of the skull with the calvarium or top of the skull removed, and I'm showing areas of skull fracture on the floor of the skull. Uh, the arrows pointing towards the top of the ceiling, those overlie the eyes and there are fractures overlying the eyes that can cause the bruising of the eyelids that we saw previously. Um, the one off to the left is showing another uh, line that you'll be able to appreciate in your photograph, uh, which is another fracture, and you can see it ends towards the top of the ceiling, splitting into a Y shape as well. Um, then you got a, a photo, uh, an arrow, pardon me, showing a fracture there on the, on the right side. Are the fractures shown in 144T fractures resulting from the entrance of the bullet into the skull or when the bullet uh, struck the back of the skull? Or if those are not the choices, then I apologize. No, uh, the, the, uh, the two pointing towards the ceiling, which overlies the eyes, um, and the one to the right, and likely the one to the left as well, are from the gunshot wound. Anything else about 144T that we want to look at before we move on? No. What's shown in what we've labeled here in your PowerPoint is 144U. We are looking at the brain. The brain is upside down. So we're looking at the left side and bottom aspects of the brain. The arrows at the top labeled subarachnoid hemorrhage of the brain are showing areas of bleeding beneath the layer called the arachnoid mater, which is a um, fine layer that covers the brain, and that's where the blood is located. It's, beno it's beneath that particular layer, and that's the cerebellum that those two arrow arrows are pointing towards. The blue arrow on the bottom is uh, labeled jacket portion of projectile recovered from the left occipital lobe of the brain, and that's the part that's the copper color of the separated jacket. The other was the leg core, the middle part of the bullet. This is the jacket, and it's, you can see just a little tiny portion of it in this particular photograph. 
even though it's not labeled diffusely over here, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can also see to the bottom rightish location of that um, area of the brain. I don't have a arrow showing you that, but that's that red stain color on the surface of the brain as well. Just for purposes of orientation, um, which part of the brain are we looking directly at uh, here on 144U? In the middle of the photograph, that is the left lobe of the cerebellum. The brain stem is lo located towards the ceiling. The right lobe of the cerebellum is up towards the ceiling, and the brain proper is all the mass tissue around that. Which, uh, on this photograph, which way would be the top of a person's head? The bottom of the photograph. Thank you. Anything else at 144U we want to look at? No. Thank you. What are you demonstrating to us here in 144V in your PowerPoint? When evaluating the brain, we do cross sections of the brain, which is red loping. So you take the brain and you cut it in parallel serial sections. This is one section and part of another section of the brain. The part of the brain that you're looking at on the left side of the photograph is the right side of the brain, so it's inverted for you. The left side of the brain is on that right side, and you're seeing part of the wound tract that the bullet went through of the brain, and you can see the destruction, the hole, the hole that you're looking at, and there's hemorrhage and tearing around it as well. The little part of brain you're seeing on the right side of the photograph is demonstrating that trapped blood in the subarachnoid space, so subarachnoid hemorrhage. And what you're seeing, again, um, this particular section is showing that the wound tract involved deep gray matter nuclear structures. On the right side of the brain, which is on the left side of your photograph, you see something that looks like a little candy corn image. On the right side of the photograph for the brain, which is the left side of the brain, it's absent, so it's been damaged. Given the portions of the brain that were damaged, as you've demonstrated to us here in 144V in your PowerPoint, did you form an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to what um, Chase Fleischauer's uh, condition in relation to his ability to move uh, would have been once he was shot? He would not be able to move. Anything else at 144V we could look at? What's your, what are you showing us here in 144W? This is the photograph of all the, the pieces of the bullet that I had recovered from the head of Mr. Chase Fleshhauer. So the gray parts on the middle to the left side of the photograph above my scale is part of the lead core. And then from the right side, the copper color, that's all parts of the jacket. So. Majority of the jacket is to the right of the scale, above and to the right, and then you can see two small copper colored fragments as well. Showing you uh, exhibit 147, um, can you tell us whether or not you recognize uh, the portions of exhibit 147 that you can see to be the same metal fragments that you're showing us in slide 144W of your PowerPoint? They are the same. Thank you. Anything else in uh, slide W we want to look at? No. Thank you. What are you showing us in slide 144X? This is now um, demonstrating the trajectory or the wound tract uh, direction as it occurred in Mr. Chase Fleshhauer. Um, you see two hands that are covered in blue gloves. You see a silver metal, metal probe that the top right hand of somebody is, is um, probing the entrance gunshot wound. And you'll see a parallel blue arrow that's indicating how it went in Mr. Chase Fleshhauer as it is in his body, which is front to back, slightly right to left, and straight. Uh, the other arrow, where the left blue gloved hand is, you can see, very difficult for me to see at this, but I believe you should be able to see it better, the end of that silver metal rod is ending in that depressed oblong um, fracture we saw in the back of the left occipital region of the head with that core of the bullet tried to get out of the skull and was located. And what you can also see at the tip of that larger arrow down there is again that same, it's a 12 centimeter linear, linear fracture of the parietal bone going from the left ear region towards the back of the head. What 
What, if any, deflection of the bullet as it traveled through the skull did you observe to be, if any? I didn't see any. Anything else in 144X we need to discuss? No. What are we seeing in 144Y? We are seeing the inside or the inner table of the left frontal region and the gunshot wound proper defect, which is the top arrow that is um, labeled off to the right, called inner aspect of in entrance gunshot wound in the skull. So you see it's circular. You see lines or fractures extending from there, radiating, radiating out there, similar to what you would see in um, a rock hitting your windshield. And you get the little chip and it starts radiating outward or spider webbing. Off to the right of this photograph, you see three blue arrows that are parallel, labeled radiating extension of fractures from the gunshot wound. You can see the, the entrance gunshot wound. You can see the pattern going downward from that entrance gunshot wound. There's another arrow on the left side labeled all fractures arrest at pre-existing fracture line. So like in your windshield, it's a similar concept. If you have one fracture in your windshield and you get another fracture developing, it'll stop at one that was already there. This is exactly what's happening in Mr. Chase Fleshhauer's skull. So this fracture on that label with that uh, left arrow occurred prior to the gunshot wound. Anything else you want to talk to us about on 144Y? No. Thank you. 144Z, what's that telling us? As part of our autopsy, we do some drug and alcohol testing, and these are the results. Um, Mr. Chase Fleshhauer had a blood alcohol concentration of 0 0.278 grams per deciliter. What, if anything, about his passing away affects his blood alcohol um, at whatever time the blood is drawn? It does not impact it unless the deceased individual is decomposed, then it will start increasing that level, and Mr. Chase Fleshhauer was not decomposed. Thank you. As um, Part of your PowerPoint presentation, uh, we have uh, what has been labeled uh, as 144AA. Uh, can you tell us what you're demonstrating in here? Here, um, is what we're looking at is range of fire testing to see if we can determine how far the end of the barrel of the exact weapon that was utilized in this particular case that caused the defect to Mr. Chase Fleshhauer and the similar or exact ammunition that was also with the gun that was utilized in this particular um, incident. What you're seeing is I'm holding up a ruler, so the surface of the target is where the ruler will start, and I'll move the end of the barrel to where I want, three, four, five, seven. So I'm doing that and marking it on a white target board. Or, yeah, white target board, and every time this has occurred, it, it occurred because I did multiple different shots with the assistance of um, the St. Croix County Sheriff's Office actually firing the gun and I'm just doing the measurement. I would take the particle board over and then right the inches away from the end of the barrel and later back at the office I would start um, measuring. What were you measuring? I was measuring the gunpowder um, that was embedded in the surface of the actual um, target board or I was measuring or observing the soot or the powdery blackish gray material that would be on the powder, um, sorry, the board. I'm just gonna call it cardboard. What were you comparing the uh, residue from the gunshot in the various range of fire demonstrations that you did? What were you comparing that to? To what I observed on the surface of the skin of Mr. Chase Fleshhauer, the gunpowder stippling on the outside that we saw on the forehead was four and a half by four inches, so somewhat circular, very circular, and that's what I was doing to see what the diameter 
or what the actual dimensions of the circular spread would be in different ranges of fire distances from the target. So to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, even though the particle board is flat and the skull is curved, it's still a valid comparison? It's useful. If you know um, how many tests, as we have a photograph of in 144A, uh, did you and the detective do? I would say around six. Based on those tests, did you find a comparison that you felt, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, favorably compared to the pattern that you saw on Mr. Chase Fleischauer's left side of his head? Evaluating both whether soot was present separately and then independently as well, the gunpowder embedded in the target board, um, the gunpowder stippling or embedded into the target board was more, most consistent with the five inches away from the target and six inches away from the target. Um, and with the soot may or may not being there, it was very, very faintly present on the target board or the particle board that we're seeing at nine inches, but it was very hard to appreciate. And I stopped, um, we, did, we did not do any further testing outside of nine inches because of the lack of um, the ability to get the same ammunition that would be was utilized in this particular case. So let's walk through those different inches if you don't mind. Okay. And 144BB, what do we see in here? Now this is showing the particle board um, in the same environment as how I was evaluating Mr. Chase Fleshhauer, so the same lighting and everything. The photograph on the left, you can see a faint haze of soot that's a little bit easier to appreciate actually on that left side versus the right photograph. This is at five inches away. So again, the end of the barrel of the weapon is five inches away from the target of the face of the board. The photograph on the right is showing you where the embedded gunpowder or unburned gunpowder that causes the gunpowder stippling on, on the skin surface, showing you an idea. The circle isn't impeding on that. I, I made it bigger but I had measured it at four and a quarter and five, four and five eighths. The next test? The next one is the similar, same exact setup, except this one is six inches away. So the photograph on the left is showing again, you can see soot on the board. You can also see it um, on the photograph on the right. And if you look at the actual defect in the board, you see that grayish discoloration in the edges of the paper going into what the wound would be which again, we did not see in the edges of the skin of Chase, either with the naked eye or microscopically. And the photograph on the right is now kind of giving you a better close up so you can appreciate the unburned gunpowder flakes getting embedded into the surface of the paper target board. And I measured that at four and five eighths by five and a quarter. The next measurement. This is at nine inches away now, so the barrel's nine inches away from the surface of this um, paper cardboard. And the photograph on the left is showing a very faint, faint, it's probably not even appreciable to you. Um, and the photo photograph on the right is again showing you a closer up, showing the unburned gunpowder flakes embedded into the um, surface of the paper. I measured that at five and five eighths by five and three quarters. And tell us again, what, well, what, what is it about noting the soot here that's important in relation to what you did or didn't find in Chase? Soot is one of the two factors that we use to determine range of fire. Soot is not appreciated at farther ranges. Gunpowder stippling is appreciated for a longer range. So soot puts the end of the barrel closer to a target. Gunpowder stippling still keeps it close range and it does eventually, the gunpowder won't make it to the surface of the skin. That makes it a distant gunshot wound. When we don't have soot or gunpowder stippling, it's called a distant gunshot wound. What if any soot did you find in Chase? I did not find any. Was that when you stopped measuring at nine inches? Yes, that is correct.
Hmm. And then the last slide in your PowerPoint. Does this include your conclusion regarding uh, the range of fire? Yes, it does. And what was your conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? That the barrel, the gunpowder stippling matched most closely with that at five to six inches with the barrel being at those two locations for that diameter of which on Chase Fleshhauer was four and a quarter by four inches. So it matched closest to that. However, the soot or lack of soot matched more appropriately with the nine inches. So it's in that range. Doctor, the fractures that um, we've looked at um, so far uh, have been uh, in the actual uh, skull of Mr. Fleischauer in the photographs that you showed us, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Showing you what's been marked is Exhibit 152 for identification. Uh, could you tell us what that object is, please? And Council, are we done using the yes, turn the lights up then, please? These are two diagrams that I generated, uh, one showing the outside of the front, the back, the, the right and left side of Mr. Fleshhauer on a humanoid figure showing external injuries and a trajectory of the wound tract of the gunshot wound. And the second diagram is showing the floor of the skull and the all in inside, so, so the inside of the floor of the skull and the inside or the inner table of the calvarium, showing um, fracture lines in Mr. Chase Fleshauer. You drew uh, the drawings in Exhibit 152 yourself? I did. And are they a true and accurate depiction of the injuries um, that uh, you displayed for us in the skull itself? Yes, they are. How if in any way would uh, being able to show us the diagrams in Exhibit 152 help you explain to us uh, that there were fractures consequential to the uh, gunshot, uh, but a fracture that preceded the gunshot? It would be helpful. Move 152 in evidence and ask the doctor to be allowed to uh, uh, display that to the jury and explain it to them. Any objection, Mr. Grant? Go ahead. Thank you. Received and permission granted. Doctor, with the able assistance. Mr. Rask, are you able to see him? Yeah. Maybe angle it just slightly more, Mr. Kain. Thank you, Your Honor. Doctor, we've been able to uh, take the second page of Exhibit 152 and make it bigger. We're going to call it Exhibit 177. If you wouldn't mind coming down so I can ask you if it is a true and accurate but larger depiction of the second page of 152. It is. Will we exhibit 177 in evidence? No objection. Received. Uh, so, Doctor, would you show us on Exhibit 177 the fractures you've been describing to us um, and uh, with the markers that you have, show us to a reasonable degree of medical certainty how you came to the conclusion that there was a skull fracture that preceded the fractures that came from the gunshot. Please repeat your question. I was looking at my diagram and comparing because there's a little extra writing on this one, so I was just... Well, I want to make sure it's the right one, so I apologize. It is the diagram, but I have extra writing with arrows from this fracture, which I'm going to highlight. Is the writing your writing? The writing is my writing. 
and the writing was done as a consequence of an autopsy that you performed on what day? On uh, the 15th of April in 2018. And maybe, Doctor, is that same writing duplicated on the smaller version? It is not. So it's not a copy of what she's working on, Mr. Kaiser? Is it in addition to what's on 152? It is addition. Is it? Your Honor, I agree to this exhibit 177. Now we have additional items on this exhibit, which I am unaware of. I object. Doctor, is 177 a true and accurate depiction in your handwriting, both drawing and words, of your findings that you made to a reasonable degree of medical certainty on April 15th of 2018? Yes. It, are the findings that you made and described in words on Exhibit 177 also found in your report? Yes. Move Exhibit 177 and evidence asked to publish to the jury. It will be received again subject to any cross. Thank you. So the question is, can you show us uh, what it was you were describing to us when we were looking at the actual skull pictures to a reasonable degree of medical certainty how you came to the conclusion that there was a skull fracture in Mr. Chase Fleischauer's skull that preceded the fractures that came from the gunshot wound. It's this particular fracture here that preceded, I'm purposely not going over the line just so you can see the color, this nice linear fracture that we've discussed multiple times, as well as it here, this is the parietal, it's a little extended that I just did there. That is the one where the radiating ones that we saw from the inner table are coming out and are resting, meaning stopping. They're stopping here at this fracture, which is that, and, I, and that, that I had additional writing off saying this fracture. These radiating fractures stop at a line that is not related. It's far away from the entrance gunshot wound. It is not connected to the gunshot wound. It is separate. The, for the purpose of the record, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, you used the blue marker to indicate the um, uh, preceding fracture that came uh, and used the red marker to indicate the fractures from the gunshot. That is correct. All right. And one more question. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, did you form an opinion? And if so, what is that opinion as to whether or not the fracture that preceded the gunshot occurred at or around the same time as the other injuries that you've described to us, Mr. Fleischauer, had that also preceded the gunshot? This fracture occurred before the gunshot, and the blue one that I indicated, and actually now labeled this fracture. Did it happen at the same time as the other injuries that came before the gunshot? Around that same time, yes. You can have a seat, Doctor. Thank you. Can I have a Doctor, would there have been, um, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, um, would yeah, there have been... Excuse me, Your Honor. Could I have her put what she put on here on this? So I yes. Can... Mr. Kaiser. Thank you. Doctor, the fracture that you marked on Exhibit 177 with the blue marker, um, where, if anywhere, on um, the person's external body that we could all see, does that fracture end near? It, end, it ends near the left ear. Do you have... Uh, do you have an opinion, and if so, what is that opinion, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty uh, regarding uh, what, uh, if any, consequences to the visible portion of a person's left ear 
could result from the fracture that you've labeled in blue on number 177? Bruising. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether or not uh, that fracture could cause blood to exude from the ear? This particular fracture, no. It's a temporal bone fracture that houses the ear that is also fractured and on your diagram in front of you. The temporal bone fracture, is that from the gunshot? It's likely it is. It may not be. I haven't, well, I don't know. Well, okay. Again, doctor, not what might be. These all have to be rendered to the degree of sufficient proof, meaning reasonable degree of certainty within your field. Question, Mr. Kaiser, jury will disregard. As a factual observation, at some point when you were dealing with Mr. Chase Fleischauer, what, if anything, did you see coming out of his ear? Blood. Now, as a matter of opinion, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, are you able to say what caused the blood to come out of his ear that you were dealing with? The fracture of the left temporal bone. Are able to say, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? And if so, what is that opinion as to whether or not the injuries you saw to Mr. Chase Fleischauer's nose uh, would have caused him to have a bloody nose? The two bruises on the outside um, that we had seen in, in other photographs are the only injuries I saw to the nose. Um, the fractures, I didn't see any fractures to his nose. Um, you can get a bloody nose through the fractures of the bones overlying the eyes as well, and uh, the ethmoid bone that's over the eyes as well. Those are the only fractures I saw. Did I see bleeding from his nose? No. are able to form an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether or not there would have been bleeding from Chase Fleischauer's ear before the gunshot. Object to that, Your Honor. He's already asked that question. Overruled. And doctor, again, that's <coughs> an opinion to that degree of proof. And first, do you have an opinion which is yes or no? I didn't see any connection of that left temple fracture to the gunshot wound. That left temple bone fracture bleeds, and it, how it will bleed is showing blood in the left ear canal. So yes, that occurred before. No further questions. Thank you. Mr. Gray, your cross. Doctor, did you just testify that the left temporal bone fracture is that a different fracture than the other fracture you're testifying to? What I testified to was that I didn't see a connection between the linear fractures of that temporal bone and the gunshot wound, extending fractures even on the floor of the skull. So how many fractures are there that were not caused by the gunshot wound? Two. Okay, and what are they? Left temporal bone and the left parietal bone. Are they connected? Those two are not connected. They point towards the left ear. And do they come from the gunshot area? No. Where do they come from? By the left ear. All right. And the Let's go back over all of these injuries you talked about. <clears throat> A lot of some of them you're calling blunt force trauma. Is that right? That is correct. And blunt force trauma can be caused by falling down, correct? Correct. By being thrown down, correct? Correct. And wrestling, could that cause on a hard floor? Could that cause?
called cause blunt force trauma. I would like you to define wrestling a little bit more precisely, well, please. Two grown men, let's put another factor in there, under the influence of alcohol, are wrestling like you see on, have you ever seen a wrestling match, professional wrestling match? I've had sons that wrestled, yes. Okay. And at home too. Okay, so what I'm asking you is that type of wrestling on a hard floor would cause, that cause <clears throat> a lot of these soft, injury, soft tissue injuries you're referring to. On bony prominences like the elbow, I could see that. On the soft part of the back of the forearms where we had two large bruises, no. So if I hit the ground and my forearms hit the ground first, that wouldn't cause a bruise. I'm going to fall out, like I'm going to fall on the ground and I catch myself by putting my forearms down first and stopping the fall. That doesn't cause a bruise. That's not the classic way people fall to the ground. You'd have a more broader bruise in that particular scenario. Well, we're not dealing, I'm dealing with a, two individuals that are under the influence of alcohol and they're wrestling. And again, this hypothetical is my position, assuming a fact, not in evidence. And I understand Mr. Kaiser and I think the jury is mindful of how they'll use hypothetical questions in their decision making, Mr. Gray. So would that cause a bruise? A more broader bruise. Yes, and what about rug burns? Would they be caused by that also? By rustling on a hard floor with a rug? Yes. And <clears throat> when you made your first determination about, well, first of all, absent all of these injuries you testified about this afternoon, your opinion as to the cause of death of Chase Fleischauer is a gunshot wound to the head. Correct. The gunshot is the <clears throat> force that killed this person, correct? That is correct. The fracture you just talked about on the temporal bone, the other fracture had nothing to do with killing him, correct? That is correct. And so, your cause of death was a gunshot wound. That is correct, yes. And when, <clears throat> when we get to manner of death, when you said it was a homicide, in your first opinion, and that was, what, what did your, what do you call them, a provisional opinion? Is that what it's called? Yes. And when did that first come out, do you remember? I don't, I would have to check my records. Could you, do you have them there? I do. I don't know if it's timed. It would be the day of or later the next day. So the 15th right. or the 16th is when it would come out in April. Okay. So it's not dated. I, I should know that. The autopsy was done on the 15th, so you came That's out correct. on the 16th? The provisional can come out the day of or potentially the next day. I don't know. It's not time stamped, so I can't tell you if it came out the 15th or the 16th. Okay. One thing we have to do, Doctor, court reporter has to take this down and we can't talk over each other. So let me finish my question. Sometimes I say them slowly. So at the time that you came out with this provisional opinion, did you have the alcohol 0.278 of the deceased? Did you have, did you have that information? No, I did not. And did you have the information that there is DNA on the pistol that killed this individual from Chase Fleischauer? No, I did not. Did you have the information that Kale Fleischauer's DNA was not found on the pistol? No, I did not. And at the autopsy at the <coughs> medical examiner's office in Ramsey County, you have the hands bagged and that's to find, or see if you can find, gunshot residue, correct? Yes, it's for the collection of gunshot residue. And did you swab the hands or whatever you do to get samples of the hands of Chase Fleischauer? And, go ahead, did you? 
We don't swab the hands. What we do is we have a kit similar to what you're looking at with this marker, if I may use that as an example, except it's much smaller. So when I, there's a cap on it, you take the cap off, the end of it, instead of being a marker, is a flat surface that has uh, an adhesive on it, so like tape. And what we do is, I'm not gonna dot my hand with this, but let's pretend this is the adhesive. If we take off that cap and dot the back of the hands going around the um, uh, middle finger, index finger, back of the thumb, back of the hand, going around to the palm and doing it again for the all aspects of the hand. And that, if there's residue there, it will stick onto that adhesive and that is then analyzed at a separate facility. And that separate facility is RJ Lee Company in Pennsylvania? Yes. And you sent that uh, testing out to them, correct? That is correct. And did you get it back? Yes. And was there gunshot residue on the left hand of Chase Fleischauer? Yes, there was. And was there gunshot residue on the right hand? Very little. All right. Let's call the director a second. Are we going to be using this larger diagram anymore? Because I think Mr. Rask is having a hard time seeing the witness, and I prefer that you not have to crane his neck. So, sorry, Judge. Are you going to be using it, Mr. Gray, this large no, diagram? No, then, Ms. Ryder, if you can. Please, it avoids the doctor having to crane her neck as well, so. <laughs> Mr. Gray, your continued cross, please. Backing up to the, what I was asking you about, the wrestling, or physical contact, when that, as far as somebody that's under the influence of alcohol, that has a .278, would they feel the pain of injury more or less than somebody that's totally sober? Objection. Relevance of whether the pain is felt from the injuries, the only thing that matters is the injuries. And again, if we'll state the objection, I'll rule on it, don't argue. Sustained as to form. Question. Have you, in your experience as a medical doctor, medical examiner, in life experience and knowledge, have, is alcohol a pain reliever? Classically, back in the old war, civil war, they would use alcohol to help suppress the ability to feel the pain. And in this case, with respect to 144E, could we put that up on the board, or should I show it? I'm sorry, I made a mistake. It's 144A. respect to soot, doctor, <laughs> with respect to soot, um, you see the towels over the top of the head of Chase Fleischauer just opening the bag when you open the bag, correct? I saw the white sheet. Um, yes. yes. And that was wet, correct? Yes, it was. And that white sheet was over the top of the head of Chase Fleischauer? It was over the face of his head. As you can see how it is, it's pushed off like I opened it and opened this way, so it doesn't come over the top. And that could be an explanation as to why there was no soot by the stippling. Fair statement. That's assuming soot was present or soot was not present, and it's possible. Well, yeah, you, you're not assuming that there was even soot present there, but if there was soot present there, it's possible that that sheet might be there. <coughs> A wet sheet over its head could wipe some of that off. Yes. Because soot is movable where stippling isn't, correct? That is correct. And 
And with respect to petechiae, there is petechiae in this case, and you described it. But that petechiae, to make it clear here, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, had nothing to do with the strangulation, correct? That is correct. That had nothing to do with the death of Chase Fleischer, correct? That is correct. And petechiae can be, you can get petechiae from straining yourself, correct? That is correct. Like attempting to push somebody off them, if you push hard enough, you can get petechiae, correct? Over a prolonged period, not a short, quick action, no. Right, like five or ten minutes, if there's two people straining against each other, you could form petechiae. That would be correct. And although you didn't see any blood in the nose of um, Chase Fleischauer when you're looking at it, that doesn't mean that prior to that he, had a, he did not have a bloody nose, does it? That is correct. And you measured uh, Chase Fleischauer's arms, I believe you said they were 31 inches long. Is that right? You not today, to... sir, no. Pardon? Not today. It's in your autopsy. It's in my autopsy, but I didn't state that today. I'm sorry. You said I stated it today. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant it. The... Oh, gotcha. I understand you now, I'm sir. not trying to trick you. <laughs> you. You know that, right? I do know that. I'm just trying to follow you. Sorry. Okay. And, and uh, in the autopsy someplace, you described his arms as 31 inches, correct? That is correct. And that's in length. Correct. That is from the top of the shoulder to the tip of the index finger, and that was for the right arm. And his uh, height was 5'11", correct? That is correct. One of the reasons you testified once before, uh, a couple times maybe, I don't remember. But in any event, one of the reasons that you determined this uh, cause of death, or excuse me, manner of death, was homicide, was because the pistol wasn't with underneath Chase Fleischauer within a foot and a half, correct? Can you restate that again, please? Sure. One of the reasons that, and it was wrong, let me know. I thought you said that. <clears throat> One of the factors that caused you to say this is a homicide is because Chase Fleischauer's body, the, the, the firearm that shot him was not within, was not underneath him or within a foot and a half of the body, correct? I did not say that today. That is one factor. I did not state that today, but that is a factor. Right. I meant, I said the last time you tested. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear that. I and apologize. Again, let's sure. be clear. In earlier testimony, did you offer that, doctor? No, I did not. Thank you. Earlier testimony, not today, but in earlier testimony. In oh, the... I, I misunderstood you, Your Honor. Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Gray. And I believe I asked this already. With respect, if, uh, apologize. Um, you, you did not have the toxicology results at the time you first made the determination of a homicide, correct? That is correct. <laughs> when you sent the GF, you determined homicide before you got the results back from the GSR also, correct? That would be correct, yes. Um, I'm going to ask you, a person with some brains here, I'm going to ask you, if I can find it here, doctor, here, on 144J, put that up please.
That's an injury to the right index finger, is that right? That is correct. And it's an injury to the trigger finger, correct? The index finger. Most people would use their index finger, so yes. And if that firearm was loosely held, and you fired that firearm before, have you not? I have fired numerous firearms, yes. Okay. If that firearm was loosely held, the bruise where you have the arrow up here, and that firearm ripped out of your hand, that could bruise that index finger just like that, correct? Objection assumes a fact, not an evidence in the hypothetical. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you'll consider this opinion only if the underlying facts are established. So this is a hypothetical question, doctor, and you can answer. It is possible, yes. Thank you, doctor. Mr. Kaiser, thank you. Doctor, you characterized the wounds on the right index finger as both contusions and abrasions. Can you tell us how that works? Uh, if something like, a, like your dog's nails scrape you, it can take off layers of the skin causing an abrasion, but you can also get underlying swelling, or not swelling, bruising, or the, it damaged the underlying vessels as well. So it's a contusion, abrasion, it's both. How does the contusion and abrasion in 144J come to be visible to you when you view Chase's body? I observe it with my eyes. What are you looking at? I'm not following your question, sir. I'm sorry. The things that you're identifying as contusions and abrasions, what is it in our body that you are seeing in a place where it wouldn't normally be found if there wasn't an injury? What part of our body are we seeing there? Oh, we are seeing the back of the um, tip of the right index finger, just below, as the picture indicates, the nail. Okay. Um, if it wasn't injured, how would it look? It would have the same exact color, that cream color that you're seeing on the screen of the rest of the surrounding skin. What does the coloring that is now different and therefore shows it to be injured come from? Um, that would come from the underlying hemorrhage blood. All right. And what is required for the heart to do to get the blood to that place? The heart would have to beat. The hypothetical that was posed to you was that the injury to his fingers, and there appears to be at least two or three of them, happened as he was being shot. Did you hear that hypothetical earlier? I did. All right. And what happened to him when he was shot? He sustained wound tracks to his brain that would render him dead. And unfortunately, his heart could beat for a few moments at least. Long enough to cause the blood to flow all the way to the end of his finger? Yes. I guess, do you, uh, do you have Exhibit 150 up there with you? If I moved it, I apologize. I do not. I don't really understand what this provisional thing is that they're talking about. Can you explain that to us? A provisional autopsy report is one that we issued either the day of or subsequently the next day, um, briefly summarizing the findings we have at the day of the autopsy. And that is issued, especially in our referral counties, so that someone who, the medical examiner in this county, St. Croix County, has information as to what is the cause and manner of death, if we have that at that time. And you did? Yes. What is the difference between the cause of death and the manner of death? Back to this, Your Honor, is repetitious. I didn't go into it. 
overruled, you can answer. Uh, cause of death is uh, the actual injury that led one to die. So in this particular case, it's cerebral lacerations or tears of the brain due to a gunshot wound. That is the cause of death. If I would unfortunately get into a car accident on my way home, it would be trauma and multiple traumatic injuries. That would be my cause of death depending on where the injuries are. In this particular case, it's the cerebral lacerations due to a gunshot wound. The manner of death is the circumstances that um, surround what caused death. So what are the circumstances surrounding um, how this gunshot wound occurred? And we have five different types of manners of death. Natural, which is natural disease process. Accident, like the car accident I just described would be called an accident. We have um, suicide, where you caused your own death at the hands of oneself. We have homicide, death at the hands of someone else, and then undetermined meaning, I can't tell which it fits into these categories. What's the difference between what you've just described in response to cross-examination, the provisional opinion, and the thing we have in evidence, which is marked as, as uh, Exhibit 150? Um, cause and manner of death aren't listed on here. It's only listed on the provisional. Does your opinion as to the manner of death remain the same? Yes, it does. Does your opinion as to the manner of death uh, remain the same um, even after the issuance of the final autopsy protocol? Yes, it's the same. What day was the final autopsy protocol issued on? It was signed on May 10th, 2018. And that's Exhibit 150, is that correct? That is correct. Did anything change your opinion from May or April 15th or 16th until, issue, until uh, Exhibit 150 was issued? No. You were asked on cross-examination whether or not you did a uh, examination of Mr. Fleischauer's hands for purposes of obtaining gunshot residue, is that correct? That is correct. Showing you must have been marked for identification as Exhibit 169. Could you tell us if you recognize what that object is, please? It's a copy of the report from the RJ Lee Group on the gunshot residue analysis. Who is it addressed to? Tina Forrest at the Ramsey County Medical Examiner's Office. So that would be your office, is that correct? That is correct. What's it dated? July 30th, 2018. So that's after you issued your final autopsy report, is that correct? That is correct. But the autopsy report, sorry. The RJ Lee report is regards to what subject? To Mr. Chase Fleshhauer. Is uh, Exhibit 169 a true and accurate copy of uh, the portion of your record from RJ Lee Group regarding Mr. Chase Fleischauer? Yes, it is. Move Exhibit 169 into evidence. No objection. Proceed. <coughs> Did the receipt of the report from RJ Lee Group change the opinion you had issued that the manner of death was homicide? No, it did not. What is it in, now here's, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty in your specialty field of pathology, what if anything is it about the GSR results in Exhibit 169 that causes them to not change your opinion that this is now a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Objective is, Your Honor, out of her realm of expertise, gunshot wound. First doctor, did you understand the question? I did. Thank you. Overruled, you can answer to a reasonable degree of certainty in your field. When an individual fires a firearm, a gun, a gun you're going to get some of those particles from residue, the, the um, gunpowder stippling, it's certain things called lead, barium, and antimony that they're, they are looking for for the analysis. 
when someone is shot or is near someone who is firing a weapon, you expect to find gunshot residue. So we do this on occasional cases where we know they've been shot. We're expecting to find gunshot residue on their hands. The absence of gunshot residue has a whole different meaning and has a different implication. Did you get the um, alcohol test results at or around the time that you issued your uh, final opinion in Exhibit 150? Before I issued it. Did Mr. Fleischauer's alcohol level of 0.278 in any way change your opinion that this is a homicide? No. Other than having a hypothetical be posed to you regarding whether or not the defendant's DNA... Object, Your Honor, again, if it's, if it's alleged again. defendant or name. If you'll name him, Mr. Thank you. Kaiser. Other than having it be posed to you in court as a hypothetical that Kale Fleischauer's DNA uh, was not found on the pistol, was that ever knowledge given to you in reference to you expressing your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, it was. Did it change your opinion? No, it did not. You were asked questions about the degree to which the um, covering over Mr. Fleischauer may or may not have affected any soot around the wound area. Do you remember those questions? Yes, I do. What if any other analysis of his injury that you showed us here today um, informed your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether or not there was soot present in his injury? I did microscopic analysis that we saw that purple image with the cut ends of the, the skin, from the surface of the skin going to the surface of the um, skull. The skull was not there, just the, the tissue itself. From the place that you've just described, on Mr. Fleischauer's body to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Could whatever happened with the sheet and the cover have wiped any soot away that had been there? On the inside of the wound, no. Well, Jeff, I'm not been aware. Thank you. Sustained as to form. Where was it on the body that you said you didn't find any soot? The microscopy showed that the, the wound tract of the skin part did not have soot. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, to what degree, if any, would the sheet or the cover on Mr. Fleischauer have affected whether or not there was soot in that place? It would not have affected it. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Mr. Gray, your recross. Um, one of the reasons that you look for soot inside of the gunshot wound is to determine whether or not it's a contact wound, correct? In order to see if it's in the close range fire. What do you mean by close range fire? Close range fire is anything that we discuss, the soot or the unburned gunpowder flakes reaching the surface of the target. That includes the gunpowder stippling, the soot. The soot, again, can only go so far. Um, you have to test fire a weapon. But in generalities, we tend to use six inches as a cutoff, which is not true in this particular case, so you can disregard that. Contact wounds, the end of the barrel of the weapon is in direct contact of the target. So it gets more embedded, but that's not the only way you get soot inside the wound tract. Okay, that's one way, though. That is correct, yes. And that's one of the reasons when you, one of the ways you determine whether or not it's a contact wound is by checking it. That is correct, yes. Now, with respect to you, now the uh, chief medical examiner, is that right? That is correct, but yes. But outside the scope of redirect form. Well, well, it is, but it also avoids having to have the doctor come back at a later date. So I'm trying to be courteous I'll be to her time as well as uh, what's going on. So with that said, Mr. Gray. And you have, a, you have a contract with Ramsey County, so you're hired by Ramsey County. Be their medical examiner, correct? Today, yes. Yep, okay. currently. So you're working for Ramsey County Medical Exam at Ramsey County today, correct? That is where the physical office is located, and yes. And we... you're getting paid by Ramsey County? Yes. And in addition to that, there's a company, I can't remember what you call it, what did you call that company? 
My company is called River Valley Forensic Services PA. Okay, and you're getting a fee there too for testifying today, correct? That is correct. So the River Valley uh, is your company, but it comes to you. Do you have any other employees? I have three other employees, yes. All right. And are these all medical examiners? Yes, they are. And you intend to send a bill from your company to St. Croix County and be paid, correct? The physician contractors will get paid, that group will, yes. And you will too? That is, yes. And in addition to that, you get your salary at Ramsey County, correct? Portion of the salary is from Ramsey County, correct. Oh, what is that portion? Off the top of my head, I don't have that figure for you, but. Are you talking about a portion of the salary are you talking about your yearly income, or you just get a Ramsey, portion? Ramsey County provides um, salary and benefit. Uh, part of that pay is for benefits, but actually the company pays for the physicians, and so these fees are for their health insurance benefits and so forth. And how, <clears throat> how much uh, have you billed so far, you know? I haven't billed anything. Well, you've testified in the past. That was not my company, sir. Okay, so now you, this is a new company? That is correct, yes. And what do you intend to build them for this? We charge a flat fee of $300 per hour for us being outside of um, our office because the taxpayers pay the majority of our salary in Ramsey County. So you get $300 an hour for being outside of your uh, doctor's office. But when you prepare for this, you're, you don't get paid? We do charge for prep time at, if and only if it goes to trial. Well, we're in trial. So, yes, there will be a bill. Okay. And in addition to that, you get paid from Ramsey County, correct? Yes. <coughs> That's all I have. Thank you. How can any, well, and Mr. Kaiser, because he went into a new line of inquiry, I'll permit a third. Just one question. Robin. How, if in any way, does how, when, or how much you got paid affect your opinion regarding the manner and cause of death in this case? No, it does not. No further questions. Thank you. Doctor, you can stand down. Counsel, why don't you approach? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Back on, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to, as I understand, have one additional uh, fact witness today, and then uh, we'll probably be breaking for the day. With that said, Mr. Kaiser. Safely calling out Damian Kosmoski. Ms. Ellen, thank you. Sorry, Officer, if you'll come up towards me, please. Raise your right hand, the clerk will administer the oath. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, Deputy, if you'll take the stand. And you can swing that microphone stand to get in, and then if you'll rotate it back towards you, please. Ms. Ellenwood. Can you state your name for the record and spell your last? Damien Allen Kosmoski, K-O-S-M-O-S-K-Y. Uh, Mr. Kosmoski, uh, where are you employed? St. Croix County Sheriff's Department. Okay. And are you employed there on a part-time basis as a deputy? I am. Were you on duty on April 14th of 2018? I was. Sometime that morning, were you asked to go uh, to respond to a crime scene at 1489 142nd Street in Richmond Township? I was. Here in St. Croix County, Wisconsin? That is correct. And what were you tasked with to do that morning? Uh, perimeter security, outside security. Uh, can you explain to the jury what that means? Perimeter security, outside security, my uh, assignment for the day was to be stationary on the outside of the property and just make sure that nobody goes in or comes out that is not authorized. Um, while you were on scene, um, do you recall how long you were there for that day? I believe I, 
approximately I got there about uh, 1 p.m. that day and left right around 6 p.m. Um, during that time, um, did you see anyone come or uh, leave the home uh, without knowing who they were? No. Meaning everyone was accounted for that came into the home and out of the home while you were there? Correct. Um, at some point um, that day, were you tasked with removing two dogs from the residence? I was. Um, can you explain uh, what you recall about removing those dogs, if anything? Uh, one of the investigators had asked if we could, they could place uh, two uh, dogs in my squad car until a family member or somebody came and picked them up. Um, at which that time, I met one of the investigators at the front door, I believe it was. Um, there was no collar or leash. Um, it seemed like a friendly dog, because I actually carried that dog. It was snowing that day. Um, placed him in the back of my uh, squad car. And then uh, I believe the second dog was brought out by a, by a leash. The dog that you carried, um, did you notice any blood on the animal? Yeah, no blood. Um, and then you said another dog was also placed in your vehicle? That's correct. Did you notice any blood on uh, that animal? I did not. We animals then left your, were they in your backseat of your patrol? They were. Um, did you see any blood um, that was left behind by any dogs? I did not. Thanks so much. Mr. Gray, any cross? <coughs> What time did you pick the dogs up? I want to say they were roughly about 3 p.m., but I didn't know if that. That would be 3.10 on April 14th? That sounds about correct. And when did you start uh, watching the house? About 1 p.m. Okay. And you're aware that prior to that, somebody else was watching the house, correct? Yes. Where did you take the dogs? They were placed in the back of my my assigned uh, squad car. I know, but where did you bring them? Like, did you bring them someplace? I did not bring them anywhere. They were they stayed in the back of my squad car. It was just a few brief uh, minutes, believe it or not, and then a vehicle arrived after that, and those individuals picked the dogs up. Okay, private party. Correct. Thank you. So. Ms. Allenwood. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. you can stand down, deputy. And those are the witnesses for today, Ms. Ellen or Mr. Kaiser. We'd ask that we be able to end for the day today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recess a little bit earlier than we have been. Uh, again, please uh, plan on arriving between 8 and 8.15 tomorrow morning. Likewise, folks, do not conduct any experiments or do any type of recreations, research, talk to anyone. Uh, as tempting as it is. With that said, secure your notes with the bailiff. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Uh, we are adjourned for the day. All rise. Record, um, <clears throat> anticipate state being done tomorrow, Mr. Kaiser? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, unless something changes as we meet this evening, my expectation is Detective Nicola will testify tomorrow. We have quite a bit of physical evidence to put in through him. Okay. Uh, but uh, barring unforeseen circumstances, I expect to be done well before noon. And Mr. Gray, do you have any <clears throat> witnesses you can call tomorrow with oh, that well, understanding? Um, I could attempt to tonight, Your Honor. But, uh, what witnesses are going to be called tomorrow? Detective Mick, or oh, Investigator yeah. Mick Well, yeah, I then you're not calling anybody from the gunshot residue place? No, we just put it in there. Okay. Well, I want, I want what about Kale's gunshot residue? Well, and again, if it was in the report, uh, I can't. Did you? I'm just telling you, I'm just trying to figure out time. Right. So with that said, Mr. Gray, if you could have a witness here, that would really be appreciated because we'll fill at least a portion of that day. Uh, and then uh, 
<clears throat> well, Your Honor, the problem If is, you can, I said. Well, I know, but the problem is, if they're not going to bring in the gunshot residue person, if they'll stipulate that there's no gunshot residue on my client, that's fine. But that document hasn't been put in the evidence. Chase's has. So, otherwise, I'm going to have to prove that some other way. Are, are you going to... Council, you talk about it. I don't want to get in the middle of, of your discussions about what's going to be coming in and coming out. I'm simply trying to manage time. So time, I believe the state has indicated it'll be done before or right around lunch. I would prefer, as I said, if there is going to be a defense, and I'm not suggesting there has to be a defense, but if there is, I'd like at least to use a portion of uh, tomorrow to do that, and then we'll take up where we're at. Thank you. We're we'll adjourned for the day. I'll call the witnesses tonight. Thank you. Judge, I was going to take on that demonstrative. I'm assuming Mr. Gray will take a picture and then I can roll it up and put it to the clerk's. Correct. The clerk will keep it for now.